Hi there, I'm Simon Persin, and I'm going to take you through what Turnkey understands as integrated risk management. So many of our clients are struggling with the concept of getting information right down at the root of the organization flowing consistently through to the top to understand how the operational activities down at the, at the, the ground level actually inform and influence achieving of the strategic objectives. So in this session, we're going to have a quick walkthrough about the different parts and how they might integrate themselves up together in a coherent risk management model. So let's give it a try. So at the top of the organization, we may have some strategic objectives, and these are the rainbow magical elements of what we're trying to achieve as a business. So let's just label those as such. So strategic so those are the top line aspirations of the organization that's what they want to achieve now in order to achieve those they need to understand what are the barriers of entry so therefore what could go wrong what are those risks so let's put the risks in place So these at this level will be the the top line enterprise corporate risks so there'll be the big enterprise risks there we're not talking about fine grain little segregation of duties ones these are talking about the, the real the big ticket items and what we're trying to do at the risk level is understand what's the worst case what's the actual scoring involved normally that's achieved through a combination of probabilities and impacts so let's just map those in probability or likelihood and impact. Normally that's multiplication. So we would multiply probability by impact and that gives us our risk score. At this point, all we have is those high level probabilities and the high level impacts. So what this would normally be called is an inherent or a worst case risk score. So we just put the multiplication there, probability times impact. Actually, let's move that, move that over to probability times impact equals inherent or worst case risk score. Now, if that risk score is maybe high or medium or intolerable for some reason, then we need to have something else in place. We need to identify a risk response or a control. So let's put that in. What that control will do is hopefully manage the impact or the probability of the, of the risk. So the way that it does that is through identifying whether it's complete and also whether it's effective. And then that will have a mitigating effect on the risk score. So we'll just annotate that out as well. Completeness or effectiveness. So that will then allow us to have a new risk score, which is the in residual risk score. Now this is often called the actual or the current risk score as well. And the aim is to make the residual risk score lower than the inherent one. So that means that our controls are working effectively. Now, there are many different types of controls. 
So the most common one that we see from an audit point of view is an access control, stopping somebody from being able to access a particular activity or function within an enterprise system would automatically mean that that risk cannot be realized. The user cannot access that function and therefore it can't be done. But those aren't the only ones. We have other configurable controls or inherent controls, things within the system that it's just not possible to do that. So it doesn't matter whether everybody's got access to achieve it, it still won't be done. So an example of that may be workflow rules. It may well be that even though everybody in the organization has got the ability to approve, the configuration drives which individual within the organization should approve it and has the actual work item to approve. And it could well be that that system prohibits self-approval for exactly those compliant functions. So we've got access relevant controls. Let's put that in green. We've also spoken about configuration controls or inherent Asian controls. And the other one that we may have is business process controls. So these could be a combination of automated, semi-automated, or manual controls that are all working to actually make sure that the actual risk cannot be realized. But what we're trying to do within the controlling environment is approve the effectiveness or the completeness of those controls in the most efficient manner. And that will then allow us to respond positively to the risk, to reduce its impact, and hopefully then allow us to achieve our strategic objectives. So let's put some reality on this. Let's actually see whether we've got a strategic objective of, I don't know, revenue growth, for example. So we want to increase revenue. Now, if we reporting revenue growth, we need to make sure that we've got the ability to be able to prove that that's legitimate. So in the risk world, we may well have a risk of mis financial misstatement. So if we've got a risk for financial misstatement, that could be caused through inappropriate postings into the financial statement, or it could be through poor controls or deliberate attempt to misstate the financial statement, so committing fraud or, or just um, not having the right level of, of diligence in that finance function. So we could have various different levels of control. We could prove that is successful or not possible through various different means. In an access controlled environment, we could be looking at the ability to post journals or the ability to actually put costs into the financial statement. So we could take a view that we can limit that to just key individuals that we know, trust, or have been trained to be able to do it. So that would be an effective access control through limiting the ability to make those changes. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not possible to do it. It could well be that the people who are able to perform those functions are actually the ones who are, are causing the problem for us. So we may also have inherent application controls in place park and post, for example, it could be possible to configure the system that if the entry is over a certain level of materiality or a certain level of funding, then a different level of approval is required and it automatically blocks until it's released for visibility into the financial statement. Or it could be that we have some different conventions or some processes in place that will control the activity. So it could be an offline review, it could be a periodic review, or it could be just a sample-based test. Now, I'm not going to say which one of those is most effective, because it could well be that whichever organization you work in is taking a very different policy or approach to it. But with the combination of those three different types of controls, we could see how the processor down at the lower level in the organization can 
either enhance or improve the level of that response against that risk, which then will allow the company to achieve the strategic objectives. And so it's this golden thread which links operational controls right the way up through the organization to the top line enterprise risks and thus client strategic objectives. I hope that's put a little bit of perspective onto the topic. And if you'd like to know more, please feel free to reach out to me. I've been Simon Person, Director of Turnkey Consulting, and here are my contact details.